Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NASDAQ CEO, Bob Greifeld, and from Bloomberg, Eric Schatzker. I guess I'll sit here. Yeah. It's a lot Good of afternoon, lights. everybody. Nice to see you again. Bob? Good to be here. So here's where I want to begin. This is a fintech conference. Is it? Yeah, it's all about stuff like. It's about gambling. No, well, that's, that's happening. Later. That, that's the other conference yeah. over there. Uh, e payments, biometric identification, shadow banking, robo advisors, cool stuff, right? Very much so. What are you doing here? The, uh, that's where the next wave of public and private companies are going, going to c come from. So the first thing I, I would say in response to your question, because I know it was a serious question, we as NASDAQ identify ourselves first as a technology company and second as a uh, financial technology company, obviously. And when we look at our employee base, we have about 4,000 employees globally. Half of them are in technology. And I like to think of our core exchange business, and we run a lot of software and services business, but even our core exchange business, when you think about it, uh, we're in the cloud, in that you have the entire street connected to us, and, and they connect to us as a service. You can't buy the exchange, you use it uh, just as you would use uh, uh, Workday or, or Salesforce on a per use basis or a per month uh, uh, basis. Uh, and we charge instead of, you know, per month we charge per contract or per trade. So our, our business has technology at its core, it's applied technology in the financial services realm. And I think what throws people off to stops them from thinking about it in that context is that we have such a strong regulatory uh, aspect mm. to most of our businesses. But if you take away the regulatory aspect to it, it looks like any other transaction processing business. So one of the things that almost certainly makes NASDAQ more interesting to this group of people and the people attending this conference is the work that you're doing with blockchain, mm -hmm. NASDAQ Link. And you now have some companies that are going to trade their shares on that platform. Why is this so important to you? Well, first off, I think blockchain will fundamentally alter uh, the financial services infrastructure. At, at the very least. I feel very confident about that. And you also could argue that the blockchain will alter some of the front office functions in a fundamental way. Uh, but with respect to NASDAQ private market, I think I have to back up for a second maybe and explain it. And uh, NASDAQ private market was a creation as a direct result of the JOBS Act. So the JOBS Act said that you could stay private with up to 2,000 shareholders and employees did not count. Before the Jobs Act, uh, you had to go public once you exceeded 500, and employees did count. So I remember doing the market open with Sergey and Larry back in the day, and they weren't that happy, and they I said, this is a great day. So well, we, were, we really didn't want to do it. We just ran into it. Google wanted to stay private for long. They ran into a shareholder ish count issue because of the employee options there. So Jobs Act changes that. Uh, so I think one, you'll see companies staying private for a longer period of time. Uh, but if you're going to stay private for a longer period of time, it's important to be able to provide to employees and early stage investors some ability to get a liquidity event. Mm -hmm. So NASDAQ private market will one, count to 2,000, so we'll track all the rounds for you and who all the holders are, and then we'll run episodic liquidity events at your choosing. You know, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, and you choose, the company chooses who can participate uh, in those. And so that's the uh, stated purpose. That's quite innovative. But then I like to say we're building innovation on top of innovation in that a lot of the ownership certificates are in the desk of the law office right now. They're literally sitting in a desk in some law firm's uh, uh, building. So we want to basically immobilize those certificates, put them on the chain, and give direct benefit, uh, as I said in the closing bell ceremony, uh, this year, by the end of this year, will be for transactional events, you know, the buying and selling of shares for NASDAQ private market companies. We'll settle and clear those in 10 minutes. 
right? So using blockchain. blockchain technology beyond the blockchain. Uh, we're partnering with Chain.com uh, in that effort, making great progress. And I just, when you talk about disruption, when you're going to have the public market, right, which has been around a long period of time and does a unbelievable amount of transactions, and it takes three days three days uh, to settle and clear. And we're going to have this disruptor coming at you and doing it in 10 minutes. That's as about as dramatic as you can get. I don't think anybody here is going to complain if you disintermediate a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> um, let's talk about this point that you were making about fundamentally altering financial infrastructure and possibly even the front office. In your wildest dreams, how will the blockchain and related technology shape the future of financial markets and perhaps even financial services more broadly? So I, I would say this, uh, you know, exchanges uh, were- Wildest dreams, remember? Wildest dreams. So let me go back to uh, 1698 when uh, uh, London Stock Exchange was formed. It was formed in a clearinghouse. And in the US, we have a story where it's formed on the curb. And you had essentially bilateral transactions in the coffee house or the curb outside the uh, Wall Street downtown uh, Manhattan. And I would trade with you and uh, you would trade with me and we knew and trusted each other. There's obviously limitations involved with that and you couldn't grow. So for the markets to grow, they had to create financial trusted intermediaries, whether it be clearing houses, banks, but you start deconstructing uh, the infrastructure, you realize a lot of that infrastructure is just to build the trust that I can transact with you when I don't know you. Now the blockchain will allow me again, going back to the 1700s, to transact with you uh, right, in a trusted fashion without knowing you, in a trusted digital fashion. So when you think of any piece of infrastructure that separates the willing buyers and willing sellers from each other, blockchain has the ability to impact that over time. Why did it take the blockchain for this to happen? Because as you pointed out, three-day settlement in the 21st century seems awfully ridiculous. Well, I, I, I don't know, but I know it took us literally 18 months thinking about the Bitcoin to come to the realization that it was about the blockchain for what, what we want to do. So uh, I don't really know. We're just not <laughs> smart enough. I, I'm embarrassed it took us 18 months. To say, how, how could it? And we had a number of different management sessions, thought sessions, some of the people uh, who were the thought leaders on that are in the room here uh, today. So, you know, sometimes the pace of human progress is uh, not as quick as you'd like. But the, uh, the concept is self-evident uh, and it has tremendous, tremendous uh, merit. And what I like is in 1971, Congress authorized the creation of what's known as uh, DTCC, which is the Depository uh, Trust. And that does, you know, that's the, uh, uh, settlement and clearance agents for all security transactions in the U.S. And it was authorized because there was a paperwork crisis in the 60s where you had to shut down Wall Street because they couldn't keep up with the demand. So they said, we need this trusted infrastructure here. And what's interesting in the congressional order, when you read it, it was meant to be short term. Um, they had no clue that blockchain could come along, but it was meant to be short term and it was meant to solve that issue. And now 1971 is a long time ago. so. I think DTCC will be around for quite some time, but you now see a different, fundamentally different way of doing things. So you make a key point. Why is it, so 44 years is a while, and regulators have grown accustomed to the DTCC. They, I hesitate to say they like it, mm -hmm. but it's, they like it for a reason. They know it, and they regulate it. So, why shouldn't the evolution be taking place in the DTCC and not at NASDAQ with your private market? Because who's to say that if your wildest dreams are to be realized, the regulator is going to feel comfortable bestowing the authority that they've given the DTC upon you? Yeah. So I, I would say this, you know, we're, we're focused on things that we can do right now of our own volition. So since we're creating NASDAQ private market out of whole cloth, and it's the beginning of time, we, we can imagine and implement ourselves. Once you get out of, once you start attacking uh, or trying to disrupt what exists today, uh, it will take a village, right? It'll take broad support. So with NASDAQ private markets, 
we also announced we're going to do the same thing with our Estonian operation for proxy voting, you know, we can make the decision at NASDAQ implementing go forward uh, to look at DTCC without getting into the SEC or Congress's comfort level with clearing houses and to defend clearing houses through the great credit crisis, uh, they performed very well. Uh, you know, you, you'd have to have a number of different players involved. And I think those discussions are starting uh, in the industry, uh, but they're going to take a while. And I would say that a year from now, Eric, you'll see the press saying, well, blockchain should all this, you, you're going to have this six months of tremendous publicity about the uh, opportunities for blockchain. And then a year from now, say, so what did it deliver? Right? And there'll still be discussions about reinventing the future. And we certainly want to be there raising our hand and say, well, we are live, we're in production, and we're de delivering value to investors. And so we're picking use cases that are doable. So right now, I think our aspirations is not to change the world, but to actually uh, achieve something that uh, renders value. I don't think you are directly implying it, but you might be indirectly. If your use case is viable, does that mean that some of the other use cases that others are exploring for blockchain in loans, for example, maybe even derivative instruments aren't viable no, right now? I, I would say one, I, I admire and applaud the other efforts and I, you know, the syndicated loan effort I think has, has merit, but I think it's a longer burn uh, to get there because you have more people involved, right? Not that we're impatient, but I like, always like being in the situation as the CEO and say, okay, let's go do this and then we can go do it. So when you talk about syndicated loans or the central clearing, mm -hmm. uh, you can say, let's go do it, but then you've got to deal with, you know, 14 other firms who then have to coordinate and these are not small small, insubstantial firms, and then, you know, they don't spin on a, a dime. So we're involved with those discussions, but I want to be uh, in a position within, you know, the next year to really have, be a world leader in delivering things. Do you see an opportunity for you to work with some of those other firms, Definitely. like Digital Asset Holdings, for example, Definitely. or R3, which I yeah, think is have... talking to Barclays and J.P. Morgan and Credit Suisse about syndicated Definitely. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know. We... Or Blockstock, even, I think, which was founded by some of your former colleagues, yeah. co-founded anyway. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you're going to see a lot of things flower. I mean, you want it to. I mean, when you have a concept this big... There's it, room for everybody. And, and, and the basic concept of blockchain is that you don't have, you know, one choke point that uh, it's not there to empower uh, monopolies. So, you know, we're comfortable with that. Well, but okay. again, a year from now, the press is going to be saying we haven't delivered enough with blockchain. And we're going to say, wait, Eric. That's an accusatory uh, we, finger you're pointing a, at. A little bit, a little bit. But you see, it's like anything, it's going to go in waves. So right now, everything's positive, right? And people are thinking about big things, and they should be, and we are also. But in addition, we're going live with blockchain for private market by the end of this year. I hope my technology people are listening, right? Can doing you, that, right? <laughs> can you see, given the fact that you see more of a viability in a private market versus a regulated public market? Doability in, in do short And term. viability. Could it be, in the interim, also adapted to other private markets, like limited partnership interests, stakes in private equity and hedge funds, for example? Yes, and uh, we haven't announced anything on that. But I, I think... Uh, you, when you look at the LPGP setup now, uh, there's a lot of things that can People change. have tried to solve this problem before without well, much success. Well, you can't solve that problem without working with the regulator very uh, closely. So it's not in my ideal power suite because I can't say go do it. Uh, you have to say go do it, but then you have to work with the regulator to get it. So you need to get, you know, regulatory technology is the way I look at it. So when we think about technology we have to build, we also say uh, to give credit to our uh, lawyers have to do this, you know, we have to invent the regulatory infrastructure technology that allows the, the flower to bloom. So with respect to liquidity uh, in uh, your LP interest, uh, that is suboptimal today. Uh, you know, we'd like to see some ways to, uh, you know, improve that. I think with respect to how you have to handle your taxes when you're an LP is suboptimal and other ways to uh, improve that. That's something that uh, we'd like to get as an improved use case. We just don't have enough uh, information yet. Some of the people here may have read Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, right. or they may be broadly familiar with the debates about equity market structure, high frequency trading, 
Uh, is there a potential for blockchain to help reform market structure? Well, uh, blockchain has zero ability to uh, process transactions at the rate we do in the markets today. So it's really kind of apples. It needs to evolve. Yeah, and you know the way the uh, you uh, basically have the miners, you're never going to get to the uh, that that rate of speed that you have. Yeah, we're operating in, in microseconds in the, in the markets today, so I don't see that uh, uh, you know in that space. But you know a lot of instruments don't trade like you know U.S. Right. equities do. So I think in other instruments uh, you you certainly can. What else out there has the potential to? disrupt your business that you're aware of? I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong to look at the use of blockchain as an effort to fend off disruption, but you could look at it that way. Yeah, but I would say, uh, you know, you have to recognize that in a regulated enterprise, uh, the biggest thing you have to worry about and be aware of, aware of is regulatory change. Right, so that just changes your world. So in the states, you had Dodd Frank, uh, in the equity market, in particular, you had Reg NMS. In Europe, we, you have known as what's MIFID II uh, coming down the pike. So it's a whole new uh, set of rules. Or Basel III. Uh, so the uh, and I would say for anybody involved with any fintech to think you can go through your life. Uh, without developing regulatory expertise, regulatory muscle uh, would be misguided, right? because sooner or later the regulators, regulators like to regulate and their mandate uh, tends to expand over time, not decrease over time. Do you sense a lack of appreciation among the startup community for that regulatory reality? Yeah, well, I, I was part of this. I was a uh, fintech op entrepreneur back in the day now, but for 10 years, and we built trading systems and deployed it on a, on a SaaS basis uh, to NASDAQ market makers, and uh, I tried very hard to ignore uh, the regulators uh, because I said I'm a technology company and uh, you know, I'm signing up with people who are regulated, why would you regulate me? And sure enough, then the commission came in one day and said, well, we think we differ with you a little bit. And they had enough, and then so I had to hire up the lawyers and find out, and they had enough latitude in the rules, right? You know, the, when you get words are very imprecise things. And in the words, the regulators have a lot of latitude to say this is something they should look at. So anybody involved in servicing regulated industries would be completely mistaken not to neglect that. Is there a reason to set up the NASDAQ private market, this venue for trading shares in private companies beyond turning it into a proof point for blockchain. And the reason I ask the question is because the dollar volumes are so small. I mean, Second Market, the company you just bought, did a grand total of $1.4 billion in transactions last year. Yesterday, in one day, $7.7 .7 billion of Apple shares traded in a single day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I, I agree, and we're one very pleased to have acquired Second Market. And I think it's a it's a uniquely talented team, and I give them credit for what they've created. But I think it's an easy audience to deliver this message. You know, you have to uh, uh, big things start small, right? So our view of the private market. Uh, is that it will be fundamentally important to us today? It's an investment, and you know, doubling down with the investment with uh, with second market. Uh, you know, the key thing I look at is I think our revenue per uh, similarly situated company in the private market will be equal to or greater than our revenue in a public company setting in time. Not, not, uh, not today. Not right out of the gate. Not right out of the gate, because one will be selling uh, to them, providing services uh, that would be more expansive and comprehensive than we would provide to a public company environment. You know, one of the questions that inevitably come up when you're talking about a private market is why private companies are staying private for so much longer. Yeah. What's your view? Well, I think they should. Uh, you, know, you think they should? You run uh, hang uh, on a second. Market. You run a stock yeah. exchange for public companies. Well, we're hedged now, uh, but <laughs> I, you know what I like to say as a CEO of a public company, uh, 
and there's CEOs of public companies here, so they'll understand this completely. It's an endless series of quarters, right? The quarters come. Uh, every, you know, you get your report card. I like to say I get my report card four times a year. And if your business model is not in a position to support that level of reporting, then you should not, not, not come public. Because uh, even if you have a good one day bounce, you know, the next quarters come, right? And so you have to have a plan uh, and a, a vision for where you want to go over time. And to say you're going to have that in year one, two, or three of your existence, you know, it'd be great if you do, uh, but it's also sometimes not entirely fair to you know, put that upon uh, you know, a, a small private company. So I think NASDAQ private market gives people the optionality uh, to see over time what they want to do. Should companies go public if they're losing money? It could be, you know, uh, you know, it depends. One, you know, our basic theory in, in the states is about disclosure, right? You, so you, the obligation for investor is to be informed, and the SEC does a great job. And now running Nasdaq private market where the companies are not registrants, you see some of the wisdom of the SEC rules uh, more so than you might have before. So. Uh, you know, the, the wisdom is that you're a registrant, you have all these disclosure requirements, investors then or their, their agents have to understand it. And so as long as something is fully disclosed and investors can make their own mature decisions, you know, that could be the right answer. But even if in, in a number of cases, perhaps even the majority of cases, those companies don't end up making money, it's still not some a disservice. Do, yes, I'm some, aware. Some, yes. Do. Yeah, some, some, do. some go on to make an awful lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it depends. I mean, the key message is you have to do your homework or you have to advise or you have to have an advisor, robo or whatever that you trust uh, <laughs> in terms of what, what you should be doing. Do you have a view on unicorns? Well, I have a view on private market valuations being fundamentally different than public market valuations. Right? Uh, so understand, when we were in a public market, we were on the public market exchange, our obligation is to accept all comers. Right? Uh, and the basic economic theory is, you know, you reduce the friction in the market, who can come in, you can have a higher liquidity, and the quality of the price discovery is mm -hmm. improved. Right? And what I like to say to a private company is for any restriction you put on investors who come in, you have to expect then probably a reduction in liquidity and reduction in the price discovery. So when you have a unicorn valuation in a private market context, it could be two people as opposed to 200,000 people deciding what that price could be. And the odds of the two people being correct are less than the 200,000 people uh, being correct. So that's the reality of these private market uh, valuations. And the other thing is uh, you're not getting the disclosure and uh, some valuations have conditions to it which are, are not available to others which have a great uh, impact on, on real value there. Uh, but public markets are your best opportunity to discover true value over time. Private market values can be entirely, uh, you know, in sync, you know, where the two people and the 200,000 people agree, but it also could be the other way around. How do you make sense of what we see now? Private companies trading, well, trading, with quotation marks, uh, at premiums to public market companies. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a natural state of being. Uh, so, you know, the fullness of time will tell you how There should be a liquidity it. discount, in other words. Definitely, right. I mean, by, you know, one of the great things about our industry is we have a whole number of academics who follow what we do all the time. And since our world is digital, we provide for free to the academic community anything and everything that happened in the market, every bid offer, every uh, trade. And so any reduction in participants has a corresponding uh, impact upon liquidity and I'll, price discovery. I'm curious to know whether you agree with Barry Diller of IAC Interactive, NASDAQ listed company. He's one of our great companies, so, and uh, he has more than one with us. He does. So We're a great fan of Barry Diller. I was speaking with him a few weeks ago, and of course he knows a few things about startups yeah. and exits for that matter. And he said, in his own sort of unique and imitable way, no one believes these private market valuations because, in his words, the shoes aren't dropping. Lots of money is coming into private companies 
and very little money is coming out of private companies. And he says when it does, yeah. the valuations will become much more rational. Yeah, uh, and I, I'm not going to say rational or not, but I think they'll, the odds of those values representing the intrinsic value of the company uh, will go up dramatically. As I said, one person and two people agreeing to buy and sell and conditionality or terms, you know, is that really value? I, I say it's a rough indicator of value, but doesn't represent true value of the company. At the end of the day, you're going to have to deal with discounted cash flows, right? So as much as I say public, <laughs> companies can go public or they don't make money, but at the end of the day, uh, it's a discounted cash flow analysis that will determine your value. Before we wrap up, uh, I'm curious to know, if you look at the industry you're in, which is capital markets, let's call it, and then more broadly at financial services, what do you think is most ready for or ripe for disruption, a business model or a way of doing business that is so, maybe it's the three-day settlement, I'm hoping that it's something else, that's so antiquated that it must change. Somebody here or not here has to do something well, about it. Uh, certainly the infrastructure of the financial services will change dramatically over the next decade. On, on the front end investing side, you know, we are keenly aware of the fact that active investing has not outperformed passive for a, a long period of time. Uh, obviously there's notable exceptions, but for a long period of time. But then you also recognize that passive has a natural ceiling to it, and if passive gets, uh, let's put it this way, if every dollar, if $99 out of 100 was managed passively, I'd like to invest the $1 in the active manager because it would be quite easy to go around it uh, because they have dumb rules that they have to uh, follow. And we run passive indexes, so I criticize ourselves a little bit, but we certainly recognize then you're going to see a, a bigger growth. You know, I think the passive will continue to grow relative to active, but then more importantly, how do you put some intelligence to passive? So somewhat splitting the difference between the two. So we call that smart beta. So I think you're going to see smart beta uh, grow, and that will also lend itself to more of a robo-advising uh, kind of world. But, you know, the handcrafted genius money manager era is, you know, not with us right now. And I think you'll see increasing use of technology, you know, beyond, you know, passive to, uh, to manage money in the time to come. All right, we have run out of time. Bob, thanks very much. Thank Bob you. Greifeld of NASDAQ, everybody. Thank you.